Give me a thumbs up when it's on. All right, so where, where we are in first, where we are historically, just to kind of remind you what has, what some of the context is, what's happened is it's been three, three and a half years since it's rained. Can you imagine three and a half years without rain? Can you imagine what that would do to the soil, to the ground? In the fall season, uh, we have a baseball field right down the street from our house, and I've mentioned this. It's like concrete, you know, and if it doesn't, now this fall it's rained. Actually, we've had a lot of rain this fall. Every single Saturday, like every Saturday game got canceled this fall, <laughs> except the first one. So, uh, and, and last week's didn't happen because the rain was in the forecast. This week's rain's in the forecast. And, but a lot of times in the fall here, we're not getting a whole lot of rain. And what I've just, my experience has been, and, and our all dirt infield becomes like scary. You don't want to feel the ground ball on that thing. Like I'll, I'll like almost roll them. To, I like hit them so soft because they'll just start bouncing all over the place because this thing is just like, like uneven concrete. It becomes so hard. And that's after a few weeks of no rain. Imagine three and a half years, you know, when we see the, the sky becoming bronze and the, the earth, be, right? The, neither one of them becoming porous, right? So entire crops have been lost. Famine and death abound. And the kingdom of Israel is now in shambles. And by the way, this is what happens when you turn away from the Lord. This is what happens when you follow the Baals. Judgment. Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab's the king of Israel. Ahab and Jezebel are evil, and they've led Israel down a path of darkness. And he is worse, Ahab is worse than any king that's ruled up to that point in time. You, you, wouldn't you love your name in the Bible? for that? You're the worst guy. You're the worst guy that's existed up to your point in time. It's like, oh man, you could put it any nicer than that. That's how bad you are. You're so bad, there was never anyone as bad as you up to your days. Ahab worships the two golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, but he goes farther than, he goes further than, he, he worships Baal, he worships Asherah, he worships the gods and goddesses of his unbelieving evil wife, Jezebel. And so the Lord has brought judgment against them, but he's also brought judgment against their so-called gods because those so-called gods were the ones who supposedly provided the fertility and the rains. And so Baal is, and this is again Baal, you've seen Baal in this relief and here on the left side, Asherah on the right. Baal is dead and he's providing nothing. And it's time to show Israel that the Lord is the true God, that he is the living God. And it's time to show Ahab and his evil queen that their gods are nothing. Now, for the last three and a half years, where has Elijah been? What's that? Uh, he was there for a portion of that time. I, I'm, think, I'm, I'm talking more like metaphorically. You're right. Is there, that's really what I'm... I, you're right to interpret me literally because that's my default mode. Zarephath over at the brook, brook Kareth. But basically, in, in, in hiding... He's been in hiding for three. Why is he in hiding? Because they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him. Evil King Ahab has been mercilessly searching for him, but the Lord has been protecting Elijah. He's been providing for him, doing miraculous works through him. But now it's time for Elijah to go back because Elijah's outside of the promised land right now. He's, out, he's up in Phoenicia. It's time for him up in Zarephath in Phoenicia which is a little, about halfway between uh, Sidon and Tyre, about eight miles south of Sidon. Uh, it's time for him to go back. It's time for him to go back into the lion's den. It's time for him to go back to evil King Ahab. 1 Kings 18 and verse 1. Now it happened after many days. Now the Old Testament text doesn't tell us how many days it was, but the New Testament text makes it fairly clear, abundantly clear. Jesus himself makes it clear, three and, a half, three and a half years. 
Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So three and a half years have passed, and the end of God's judgment is near. So you have this this word from the Lord that rain is going to come. Again, it's time for the Lord to show who he is. It is the Lord and no one else who provides for Israel. It's the Lord alone who covers the heavens with the clouds, who provides rain for the earth, who makes the grass grow on the mountains, Psalm 147.8. Only God, only the Lord, not anyone else. And so God speaks to Elijah once again and sends him to this evil king. And he is, again, about to display his greatness in one of the most dramatic ways possible. Again, one of the reasons why this passage is so remembered with this 1 Kings 18 is such a, a memorable, such a memorable passage. Because it's time for a showdown between the Lord, the living God, and Baal. Which one is God? Well, we know the answer. Now think about this from Elijah's perspective. The last three and a half years, you've been kind of living in hiding. And now you're being sent to the guy who wants to take your life. No one wants Elijah dead more than Ahab. I mean, we don't know that for sure, but I imagine few people would want Elijah dead more than Ahab, and few people if anyone would want Elijah dead more than Jezebel wants him dead. And so God is now sending Elijah into the lion's den. By human reasoning, this can be kind of like a suicide mission. You're sending me to these people who want to kill me? So that takes a certain level of faith. It does. It takes a certain level of faith. Elijah's name you know, kind of displays that a little bit. Uh, My God is the Lord. And he acts by faith regardless of the consequences. You know, it reminds me of something that happened here in in the early days of me being the pastor. And I think people thought I was, what's the word? uh, That's what I'm looking for. They thought I was easily influenced. (laughs) You guys know I'm probably not so easily influenced, right? It's, it's, It's hard it's hard to move me from something that I'm convinced about. Do you guys tend to agree with that statement? I'm, 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 I'm not easily influenced. Well, well, I think some people early on might have thought that, uh, you know, I was easily influenced. And um, I remember we had a meeting and, 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 and we were going to do something that, you know, the Bible said was pretty clear. I mean, we, it, was, it was the right move. And, uh, and I remember someone saying something like, yeah, but how are they going to take that? And what, basically, in other words, what about the consequences? And my response at the time was, who cares about the consequences? You do what's right without regard for the consequences, right? Something like that. And when it comes to right and wrong, the consequences don't really matter. Well, for Elijah, God says to do this, and the consequences, they don't really matter. And if God has protected him and provided for him for the last three and a half years, you're putting your hands, you're putting yourself in God's hands at this point. And so Elijah takes the 50-mile trip, approximately 50-mile trip from uh, where he is in Zarephath to Mount Carmel. Now, just to kind of give you a feel for where, what, what, what's going on here, it's relatively self-explanatory that this is Israel, this is Judah, this is the land of the Philistines, uh, sometimes called the 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 coastal plains or the southern area of the coastal plains. And uh, and up here is Phoenicia. So if we were going to zoom in here on our map, I'm just going to kind of zoom in on Phoenicia. And what we're going to say here is that Zarephath is right around here. My drawing didn't really come out right there. I'm doing the best I can with my finger. Let's see right there. And uh, Mount Carmel is right around here. All right, so we're talking about a 50, you, you, you'll, you'll know, actually, uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to show you that most of this traveling happens within Phoenicia, and, and Mount Carmel is, is basically just inside what at the time was Israelite territory. Now, if we were to pull up 
another map, we could really see quite a bit more, more clearly where Zarephath is, which is here in the land of Phoenicia and where Mount Carmel is, right? So we're talking about 50, we're talking about two, three days maybe, two, three day trip. <coughs> So Elijah, verse 2, went to show himself to Ahab. Now, the famine was severe in Samaria. So where, where the king is, is down the Jezreel Valley. And there we go. So if Mount Carmel is in here, Samaria is around here. We're not 100% sure where they're meeting, but I, I'm, I'm, I've got myself on pretty close to Mount Carmel. Well, for some time, Elijah has been living just miles away from, as we talked about, Jezebel's hometown. And although they have been searching for him, they, they can't find him. And now Elijah is going down to meet Ahab. And things are bad. Things are bad. The famine is severe in Samaria. Things are bad in the capital city. In this case, Samaria uh, most likely being a reference to the city itself, but very possibly being a reference to more than the city and to that northern region. Sometimes this whole northern region that you see in the map, uh, sometimes this whole northern region of Israel is, is referred to, in judgment at least, as Samaria. It's referred to by its capital city. That would be like saying, um, look what, if you were in England and you were watching the news, Washington has decided this. Well, that was just basically saying the United States is doing this thing. Well, here, I'm, the way I'm reading this is, is more than likely a reference to the city itself, but perhaps beyond that. What we know is that at least things are bad in the capital city. Food is scarce. The people are dying. And Elijah is a wanted man. And, you know, things get so bad. Things get so bad during famines. And we're going to read about that in coming months. Things get so bad that people eat their own dung and drink their own urine. And if you think that's bad, that's got nothing on what I'm about to tell you. Could you imagine, by the way, having to eat your own dung to stay alive? That doesn't sound like something, that doesn't sound like a situation you want to be in. But I'd rather be in that situation than eat my own children because that's what some people did. They ate their own children. They ate their after... There's a thing about eating your afterbirth now. Is that a thing? That's a thing, right? People take their afterbirth and they put, them in a, they put it in a jar. They put it in capsules and they eat their own afterbirth. No comment. Okay. <laughs> Whatever the things that people do today, only, only during times of great famine would people do something like that. But today, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to judge anyone, but it's not something I'm going to do. Not something I'm ever going to do. Sorry. Um, but there were some women who were so delicate that they wouldn't put the sole of their feet on the ground, the Bible says. And meanwhile, they would eat their children and their afterbirth without sharing it with the rest of their families. That's the judgment we see from God. Things are bad. Things are bad in the capital city of Samaria and perhaps beyond that. And so we see Elijah being told to go. We see Elijah going by faith. And at this point, the scene kind of shifts over to a conversation. It, it kind of shifts over to a conversation between evil King Ahab and one of his most faithful servants, uh, Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is, isn't just some average guy. He's a guy of faith. Check this out in, in verse 3, verses 3 and 4. Uh, Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, she was out there murdering and killing the prophets, imprisoning and killing the prophets of the Lord because she hates the Lord. And we use that, 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 that statement that, uh, that Jezebel hates the Lord as much as Elijah loves him, right? She hates the Lord. 
uh, she's destroying the prophet. When, when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah, the king's servant, he's over the household. Uh, he runs the affairs of Ahab's palace. He's most likely a worshiper of the Lord, at least in secret, because Ahab and Jezebel are evil, right? Look what Obadiah does. Obadiah takes a hundred prophets, prophets of the Lord, and hides them by fifties in a cave and provides them with bread and water. So what we see about Obadiah, this servant, is that he fears the Lord greatly. He fears the Lord greatly. And it is dangerous. I mean, think about the fact that your boss, your bosses, at least one of your bosses, hates the Lord and is murdering its prof- his prophets. And this is the person you work for, right? He fears the Lord. And he's willing to put his life on the line, saving the, life, the lives of a hundred men whom Jezebel has no problem murdering. Obadiah is like, a, the way I read the passage, he's like a double secret agent. You know what I mean? And uh, hiding the, the, the prophets from the grasp of the evil queen. A hundred prophets. And, and of those hundred prophets, he is providing them with bread and water. So what's that tell me? What's that? He fears God more than Ahab, uh huh. Hold on a second. What was that? Uh, a, a little, because remember, S- Samaria really, the king, the king's palace is going to be the last place to lose food, right? Everybody else might be losing food, but the king and his palace, if there's anything left, they're the ones that are going to have it. Hold on one second, Corey. Um, I heard something up here, I think. He's got a lot of bread and water. A lot of bread and water. So sometimes the answer, you know, it's, 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 sometimes the answers I'm looking for are just so simple, right? And, and you guys are like thinking like really deep about, and I'm just like, I'm, he just has, he has bread and water. He has bread and water. <laughs> what were you going to say, Corey? What that says to me is that he still fears the Lord by not killing the prophets, but hiding them. Oh, he fears the Lord because he's hiding them and saving them from death, yeah. Well, yeah, he wouldn't be killing them. Yes, Jezebel would be killing them, and he's saving their lives. He fears the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, the fact that you ever try to feed a um, hundred people before? <laughs> you ever try to? Now, for us, we could provide water for a hundred people fairly easily from our faucets, and then we'll get a bill later on, you know, and it wouldn't be uncostly, but, uh, you know, just providing, the, and by the way, the, the, the word bread here, Anyone remember the Hebrew word for bread? I've said it so many times. You should kind of know it by now. But, Paul? Lechem. And how do you remember that? Bethlehem, right? The house of bread. So, Lechem. And it could be translated as food or bread, right? So, back in the days of, of, uh, of Naomi, and, and, and Elimelech and, you know, those guys, that is, in the book of Ruth, there was no bread, there was no lechem in bait lechem, right? There was no bread in the house of bread, if you're translating it literally. So here, you know, he's providing them with bread and water or food and water. And to be able to provide 100 people with food and water, to, to, enough to, to keep them, uh, sustain them, suggests at least, at least suggests that he's a person of means or a person who has access to means, right? Would we agree with that? We would agree with that. When everyone else is starving, he has food to feed a hundred prophets of the Lord. That says something. I don't know everything it says, but it suggests that he has access to stuff or that he's a person of means, but it's dangerous. This is dangerous. And if you're providing them with bread and water, it's not like You put them in the cave, and you forget about them. Like you're going back and forth with stuff, with enough food and drink to to provide for them. That's dangerous. If Jezebel finds out, you're toast, right? 
you're dead. Dead meat. And they probably eat you at that point. I mean, I don't know how. They might. And so Obadiah is a man of faith and perhaps a man of means, perhaps, or at least with access to it. And as far as we can tell, Ahab doesn't know what's going on, as far as we can tell. But the king also knows that Obadiah is a good worker and he is over the household. He puts him in charge of his house. And when the food is running out uh, for Ahab, there's only one guy that he's going to trust, and that's Obadiah. Uh, Check the best worker you have. Check it out in verses 5 and 6. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps, hopefully, perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. And so, you know, there's something that stands out to me here. So judgment is against Ahab and against Jezebel and against the worshipers of Baal. But that judgment even affects worshipers of the Lord. It even affects people like Obadiah. It even affects people who are faithful to the Lord, to like those hundred men, to a certain... And Obadiah's out searching for food. They're looking everywhere just to, for, to find grass to keep the animals alive. Because if those animals die, they're done. Some of their food sources go away. Some of their protection to be able to protect themselves, like the cavalry against enemies, goes away. So they need to keep the animals alive as much as possible. And so Ahab and Obadiah are going throughout the land, searching to and fro, looking for food. That's how bad it is. Obadiah searches the mountains and he searches the valleys. He searches the dried up stream beds, but he finds nothing. And then he sees a man, a face that he's seen before, a familiar man, a man who three and a half years earlier entered the king's palace, assuming this happened at the king's palace. A man who three and a half years earlier entered the king's palace and prophesied that it won't rain until he says so. And now this is the man. You went out searching for food and you found the guy that everyone's been looking for for the last three and a half years. And that's great and awesome and it's terrible at the same time. Check it out. In verse 7, Obadiah, I imagine, can't believe what his eyes are seeing. Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, Eliyahu? My God is the Lord. Is this you, Elijah, my master? He prostrates himself before the prophet of the Lord. This is like the chief prophet. He realizes that Elijah is a great man of God. And then Elijah tells him to go and tell Ahab that he's returned. In verse 8, he said to him, It is I. Go, say to your master, Behold, look, Elijah is here. Ahab's long wait has ended. Elijah is here. And when Obadiah hears Elijah's words, he's afraid. He's afraid of the wrath of the king. Appropriately so. Look at verses 9 through 11. He said, What sin have I committed? What sin have I sinned that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? You're killing me. You're going to kill me right now. What have I done that you're going to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, which is interesting language. Right? The same language that was used by the, the woman of Zarephath, right? The widow of Zarephath. Could be a little bit of a maybe. Could be a little bit of a kink in the in the armor. Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. Could just be the language he's using. It's not the language that Elijah uses, but it is the language that the Phoenician, Syro Phoenician woman used. As the Lord your God lives. There is no nation or kingdom 
where my master has not sent to search for you. I mean, they've searched the land of the Phoenicians. They've searched the land of the Philistines. They've searched the land of Judah. They've searched the land of Ammon and Moab and Edom and maybe even uh, Syria and Assyria and Babylon maybe and Medo-Persia. I don't know if they went that far. That's pretty far. Egypt. There is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. That is, we've searched everywhere. Everywhere within reason. And when they said, he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. And now, you're saying, go, say to your master, behold, Elijah's here. It'll come about when I leave you that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, when I go back to Samaria and I tell him you're here and you're not here, he's going to kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Ahab has searched everywhere for you. Now you're telling me to leave you here, go back to my master who wants to murder you, and bring him back to this place. If you're not here, I'm dead. I'm gone. What sin have I committed? And so he tells Elijah what he has done for the Lord. Really, almost in a, like, pleading, almost for his life here. Like, please, please don't put me in this situation. Please don't hang me out the dry Verses 13 and 14. Has it not been told my master, that is Elijah, has it not been told my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? She's already murdering prophets of the Lord. Has it been told my master that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with lechem, with bread and water, food and water? And now you're saying, go, say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. How many times we see that phrase? Behold, Elijah is the third time we've seen that now. And now, You say, go to your master and behold, Elijah is here. He will then kill me. Ahab is going to kill me. He understands his boss. He knows his boss. You think he knows Ahab? He knows Ahab better than almost anyone knows. He's over Ahab's household. He's seen the things that Ahab's done. He knows the lengths to which Ahab will go. And he knows that Ahab would kill anyone, including, him, including Obadiah. He was willing to take risks. He was willing to go and secretly hide these prophets and nobody would, hopefully nobody would find out about it, knowing there were risks, knowing he could be caught. But this is like suicide if Elijah isn't there. So he fears for his life, which again is reasonable. But Elijah gives him assurance in verse 15. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, as the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Look at the language Elijah uses. He doesn't say, as your God lives, as surely as your God lives. Uh, He is, the Lord is his God. And so Obadiah trusts in the words of Elijah and the Lord, and he goes to meet Ahab, even though it may cost him his life. And that takes what? Courage is a good word. It's not the one I was looking for. Faith is the one I was looking for. Faith is the one I was looking for. Courage, certainly. Faith, absolutely. You're going to go back and tell the lion that you let his prey go. (laughs) You know, he's not going to be happy. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. You think Elijah was there? He wasn't there. No, I'm just teasing. (laughs) That'd be terrible. He wasn't there, and Obadiah got murdered. Story's over. Close the Bible. Let's go home. (laughs) No, no, that's not what happened. Now, uh, look at... uh, Look at verse, look at verse seven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've got such, a, such an evil, seriously, if left to your own devices, you have such an evil mind. Don't try to deny it. We all do, okay? We're sinners by nature uh, and we're sinners by choice, okay? So, 
but, but it would have been funny if you were just reading it. Sorry. I mean, it's not funny because it's a person's life, but you know, you're reading it, you just, you know, we're 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? Ahab sees Elijah as the troubler of, he thinks this is Elijah's fault, that Elijah is the troubler of Israel. But he couldn't be more mistaken than he is. He's too foolish to realize that he himself is the troubler of Israel. He's too wicked to realize that his own sin is what's being judged. And if he knew his Bible better, and he knew the Lord better, he would understand this fact. And so Ahab twists the story. He twists the story to make Elijah into the bad guy. And by the way, that's how unrepentant sinners often work. But Elijah will not let Ahab's false narrative go without correcting. He's going to tell it it as it really is, and uh, he's going to correct Ahab's twisted version of reality, because that is twisted. His version of reality. You troubler of it. That's a twisted version of of reality. So he says, so Elijah says, he says to him, he says, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, the house of Amri, right? You And your father's house have troubled Israel because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. You are the real troubler of Israel. This is your fault. No one else. This is your fault. You have destroyed Israel. You have gone and worshipped the Baals. You have gone and worshipped false gods. And now the judgment of God is upon you. And so having corrected The evil, spiritually blind king, Elijah, calls for the showdown. Verse 19. Now then, after having settled that, after having corrected this false understanding of reality, now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now it's time to see who the true God is. Is it Baal or is it the Lord? It's time to see who provides for Israel. It's time to see who has power. It's time to see who is real and who isn't. And that is setting the stage for what's going to happen next week. There's a lot to talk about next week, so we can't keep going. Otherwise, we'll be here for another hour. But in this passage, what I see, setting the stage, preparing for the great showdown between the Lord and Baal, what I see is faith. I see it sprinkled throughout. Who did we see act by faith in this passage? We saw Elijah act by faith. It takes faith to go and see Ahab. It takes faith to go and see a man who's been hunting you, who's been hunting your life for the last three and a half years, and yet Elijah places his faith in the Lord, and he follows the Lord again without regard for the consequences. We see Elijah's faith. We see Obadiah's faith. Right? Here's a guy who works in the lion's den and he puts his neck on the line to save a hundred prophets of the Lord, which is a big risk, which could cost him his life. And then he goes and he, and he acts by faith again by going to the king without Elijah, by listening to the word of the Lord. So we see men of faith. We also see an evil man who refuses to take accountability, which is Ahab. Ahab places all the blame on the man of God. <laughs> Isn't that something? The evil, the the worst guy, the worst king in the history of mankind up to that point in time blames the prophet of the Lord for the troubles that he himself created. Calls Elijah the troubler of Israel, but he is the true troubler of Israel. And so we see men of faith in this passage and we see a troubler of Israel. But in the greater narrative, going all the way back to the moment Elijah stepped into the king's palace, dealing with his his time at the brook Kareth where he was fed by ravens, to his time at Zarephath, to the raising of the widow's son, to 
to the, 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 the setting the stage here for Mount Carmel, to what's going to happen at Mount Carmel, the truth of the whole passage that really sticks out as one full narrative is that the Lord is the one true God. He alone decides when the drought starts. He alone decides when it will end. He's the one who's pulling all the strings here. He's the one who's directing the prophet. And soon everyone will know that the Lord is God. Not Baal, not Asherah. And Ahab will see it. It'll be clear. The Lord is the one true God who reigns on high. And next week, he's going to prove that to Ahab and to Jezebel and to everyone else on Mount Carmel. And 800 years after this, 800 years later, he's going to prove that fact to the entire world when he sends his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and then raise him from the dead. And so, the main point of all of it, in this passage, again, we're seeing faith and we're seeing wickedness and and we know that the Lord is, is over all of it. The main point of all of it is that you need to place your faith in the one true God. And of course, for us, we have a lot more than Elijah had at his time. You need to place your faith in the completed work of the cross because the Lord is the only true God. And the cross is his only way of salvation, faith in who Jesus is and what he did. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 480. 480. If you're not sure you're saved, then see me on the, the way out at least. Or during this song, you can come and see me here, up here up front and we'll get you lined up with someone who can explain the gospel to you more clearly. If you're in the room and there's some, some things that you're struggling with, some sin or whatever else, maybe you find... Maybe you find